In western Kentucky, some farmers and ranchers are trying to prosper by breeding unconventional livestock. James Legilia has the story. In the 80s, it seemed like all Americans had two obsessions, staying fit and making a lot of money in the stock market or through real estate speculation. Now in the 90s, this Western Kentucky couple hopes the fitness craze continues so they can continue to make some big bills, dollar bills that is, with their big birds. It's a red meat, but it's lower in cholesterol and fat and calories than fish or chicken and um, it tastes like beef pretty well so it's beef without kind of like beef without all the things that are bad for you to be more specific ostrich meat has more protein and about 15 times less fat than most other types of meat and those low fat statistics could mean a fatter wallet for the enox on uh, the other pair of birds that we sold the first pair we made close to seventeen thousand dollars profit in a year. In one year on two birds. It's such, it's such a unique operation, though, that not that many farms are in existence right now. But the secret has flown the coop. Hundreds of these feathered vertebrae are making tracks on farms throughout Kentucky and the Midwest. And one agricultural expert says anybody looking to make a fast buck could wind up getting egg on their face. In order for the, for the uh, business to be profitable uh, in ostriches and that type thing, there's basically going to have to be a market developed for the meat. Uh, it's not something that you see on the grocery store shelves everywhere. Judy adds there's also a market for ostrich leather, but again warrants it's a market that faces stiff competition from less expensive and more abundant cattle leather. Transporting them could also be a problem. Any chicken farmer thinking about diversifying should note they can grow up to 8 feet and weigh over 300 pounds. But you can sure bet if raising ostriches really takes off, It'll give the word critter around these parts a whole new meaning. From Paducah, Kentucky, I'm James Legilia. Fatal tragedies may finally be on the decline in Christian County. If 3,000 petition, petitioners have their way, life-saving paramedics could be a new addition to our fire department ambulances. The problem is that could mean higher property taxes for county residents. Fiscal court members held a hearing this morning to assess opinions pro and con. TV 43's James Legilia reports. <laughs> Ambulances operated by Hopkinsville's fire department respond to thousands of emergency calls throughout the Christian County area, with the rate rising every year. But emergency medical technicians who staff them cannot by law and lack of training perform any medical procedures carried out by paramedics. Procedures that in emergencies could save lives. They can start an IV, they can give medications through those drugs, they can manage an airway in the event of a respiratory arrest, and also in the event of a cardiac arrest with patients going into ventricular fibrillation, they can defibrillate that patient back to a normal sinus rhythm. This morning, magistrates met to accept comments on a petition whose 3,000 signers hope will create a countywide ambulance tax district. The new district would be authorized to levy up to 10 cents per $100 of assessed property valuation to go toward hiring paramedics. It would take half of that, 0.05 per hundred, and what that would translate into for a $62,000 home, uh, that would approximately be $32.50 a, a year increase in property taxes. That's $32.50 too much for some Christian County homeowners. But there's a time also when uh, people have paid all the taxes they can pay. The people on fixed incomes cannot take any more. Fiscal court now has 30 days to take action with a decision likely in July. But arriving at that decision may not be easy for any of the eight magistrates. They're voting on a potentially life-saving service, but nearly all want to weigh public opinion before raising property taxes. And based on reaction today, property owners opposed may outweigh those in favor. In Hopkinsville, James Legilia, TV 43 News. Here at home, a makeover's in the works for North Fork Little River, giving area residents more access to local recreational areas. The North Fork Little River Committee met today to discuss plans to clean up and beautify the area. This effort is partly in response to a public survey. TV43's James Legilia tells us what we can expect. 
The present use of North Fork Little River is minimal due to poor water quality, poor accessibility, and safety concerns. And the North Fork Little River Committee has been working since January to improve this situation and make the North Fork a viable recreational resource for Hopkinsville and Christian County. We want to improve the look of census ears within the city of Hopkinsville, and the river is not going to move, so what we need to do is improve it. Improving it, however, could be a formidable task. The committee first plans to clean up the river from Vine Street to the end of Cox Mill Road, and the debris consists of everything from car parts to refrigerators. A lot of this stuff is it just litter that blows and washes down the creek from road surfaces and yards and places like that. It's not, they don't walk to the creek and throw it in, I don't think. Second, the water quality would be upgraded. Finally, the beautification can take place, basically cutting back unwanted vegetation, installing weirs for canoeing, planting trees, and installing a river walk between West 7th Street and City Hall. The committee hopes to begin the bulk of its work this fall, but there's no telling when the project will be completed. There's also a practical purpose to all this besides beautification. The committee feels the cleanup effort will, to some extent, reduce the frequency and duration of flooding, a problem we've all been hearing a lot about lately. At Little River Park, James Logilia, TV 43 News. More jobs could be in store for our area now that prospective industries have a new place to locate. Christian County's political and business leaders announced the establishment of a new industrial plant site today. This second site is expected to continue attracting new businesses to our community at least for the next 10 years. TV 43's James Legilia attended the ceremony, files this report. <laughs> Local economic development and political officials broke some key ground this morning in expanding Christian County's industrial horizons. After two years of painstaking planning and negotiations, a new 400-acre industrial park south of Hopkinsville was announced. And this ceremony for Commerce Park signals the start of new opportunities to create jobs and strengthen the economic future of this area. It's also an opportunity to celebrate the success of this area's energetic and professional economic development work. Success still depends on purchase negotiations with the second landlord and the final commitment from companies purchasing sites. But officials here are very optimistic about this park's future. And we look out today that we're going to dedicate 400 acres plus, maybe, that within three months, over 300 of those acres could already be gone for three new industries. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I think we would all deserve a round of applause for that. Another optimistic sign indicating industries will come on board is the convenient railroad access to the park. That, along with Governor Jones's preliminary offer of several hundred thousand dollars for utility lines and roads, could help to ensure the sale of over 25 plant sites and true success. At the new industrial site, James Legilia, TV 43 News. Katie's took one small step this morning to ensure a drug-free community. They kicked off the weekend by sponsoring a drug-free Saturday. TV 43's James Legilia has this report. I'm free. Praise the Lord, I'm free. No longer bound. No more. The day began with gospel singing and raising the American and their flags. It ended with athletic events and other fun activities. But to officials here in Cadiz, this dare, or Drug Abuse Resistance Education Day, was no laughing matter. What we're trying to do is just get the community together and uh, have a drug-free, uh, alcohol-free program and uh, show them that we're interested in the community. Now we have an activity here. It shows that we care. Besides free food and police and fire department demonstrations, Cadiz Police Chief Ray White showed that he cared by giving a positive prep talk. Every time you see a police car, it's the first thing everybody does. Boom, they got to run out there and go see what's going on. No, let's go see what's going on. And, and it's usually a negative kind of thing. And what we're trying to do today is just kind of let you people know that it's not all negative. And we're not here to arrest people. We're not here to harass you. We're not here to bother anybody. We're here to help you. 
Cadiz Housing Authority Executive Director Donna McNichols also passed out literature, specifically targeted for younger residents. But can such small efforts as a drug-free Saturday picnic really prevent future drug abuse? Of course, if, if one child learns one thing today, then we think we've been successful. Well, it looks like they were successful with more than one child today. I think kids shouldn't do drugs. People shouldn't offer them. It's a bad thing to do. I learned about most of this in, in D.A.R.E. The Cadiz community has felt like it's come under siege lately from gangs in Hopkinsville. And this D.A.R.E. program is one of many ways they intend to fight back. In Cadiz, James Legilia, TV 43 News. Well, some Christian County youngsters didn't let this morning's bad weather keep them indoors. Instead, they opted to go fishing, participating in this year's fourth annual Kids Fishing Derby. The event was sponsored by local businesses Casey Yost and Knight and Hale, who donated fishing equipment. TV43's James LaGilia got up bright and early to see if the fish were biting. This year's Kids Fishing Derby got off to a rainy start, but it turned out to be a sweeping success. Children from throughout the community, ages 5 to 15, cast their lines at Hopkinsville's Lake Morris. And they sure had fun. Adult sponsors had a good time, too. But for them, this event was a way to hook young people's free time and interest into other pursuits. That won't harm them in the long run. We've had kids that have told us, too, that they didn't realize that they could get as involved in something like this. They're not bored all the time. They don't. A lot of kids will turn to drugs, I guess, because they have nothing to do. Uh -huh. And they tell us now they have something to do that's fun, and they don't need that for a high. You can get a natural high. What's important is that these kids are here today, and they're not somewhere else. And the alternative could be bad. So, you know, we got to take care of the generation to come. Any parent interested in encouraging their child to take up fishing doesn't have to wait till next year's derby. Just contact Hopkinsville's Recreation Department, League of Kentucky Sportsmen, or Hopkinsville's Bass Club. At Lake Morris, this is James LaGilia, fishing for TV 43 News. Well, Hopkinsville's Riverside Cemetery held its own observance this morning for those Kentuckians who made the supreme sacrifice fighting our nation's wars. 21 Kentuckians who fought in the Vietnam conflict are still missing in action. And officials at today's ceremony are concerned that younger generations may have already forgotten them. TV 43's James LaGilia reports. For many of these veterans, it was a pilgrimage of sorts. Not all were from Christian County. Some had traveled as far as Florida to honor their fallen comrades and others unknown who answered the call and made the supreme sacrifice during their war and other wars before and after their time. Retired Hopkinsville Community College President Dr. Thomas R. Riley, a foreign war veteran himself, expressed anxiety that younger generations no longer recognize the significance of this sacred day and the sacrifices their forefathers had made. I think all of us will remember back to a, maybe a simpler time when this cemetery would have been filled with families out decorating their graves. I'm very f fearful that today Moral Day, and it was Decoration Day when I and when most of you were growing up, has become just another day off from work, a day for backyards and beer and barbecue. Younger community members were indeed lacking at today's ceremony, and Mayor Wally Bryant echoed Dr. Riley's concerns. I, I do feel that many people today just look at this as a holiday, a time to have family get-togethers and barbecues and so forth. I think it's very important during these times to remember what we have in this country, the freedom that we have, and to realize that a lot of it did come with great sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice for many people. At Riverside Cemetery in Hopkinsville, James LaGilia, TV 43 News. Well, President Clinton officially renewed China's most favored nation trading status this week. MFN's renewal is controversial because of China's alleged human rights violations. Mr. Clinton's decision is expected to benefit both the U.S. and China economically. And TV43's James LaGilia looks at how it can affect a local manufacturer right here in Christian County. During the fall campaign, candidate Clinton hinted China's MFN status should not be renewed. But has the president's China policy really achieved 
The Chinese leadership still sells missiles and nuclear technology to Middle Eastern dictators who threaten us and our friends. A Clinton administration, he promised, would not reward nations violating human rights or the New World Order. But today, President Clinton is faced with a domestic problem that haunted his predecessor, a lingering recession, and any Chinese trade retaliation from a denial of most favored nation trading status could exacerbate America's economic woes. Here in Christian County, a denial of most favored nation trading status to China could have also guttered future exports for a bowling ball manufacturer. Everybody's excited about uh, mainland China. Mike Quitter is Ebonite's international sales manager. Just five days ago, he was in Asia trying to open up markets for the Hopkinsville company. Quitter thinks Ebonite's revenue potential in China is enormous. You know, there's a potential there for 250 to 300,000 bowling lanes, which as many bowling lanes exist right now in the whole world. If indeed the mainland Chinese market uh, happens, uh, which we all think it's going to happen, uh, I could see container after container of bowling ball uh, leaving here, uh, heading towards Asia. The Department of Commerce estimates that for every $1 billion in U.S. exports, 20,000 Americans are put to work. So if Mr. Quitter's predictions of a bowling fad in China materialize, this community could benefit. In Hopkinsville, James Legilia, TV43 News. Well, Ebonite executives and Christian County political leaders hosted a delegation of foreign businessmen today. Most corporations strongly believe exports are key to America's economic success and future job growth. And Ebonite, along with Judge Frank Gary and Mayor Wally Bryan, tried to open the door for our community. TV43's James Legilia reports. <laughs> To these foreign visitors, Hopkinsville, USA means more than just a place to sightsee. It's the home of the company that helps keep them in business. They're independent business people, buyers and sellers of Ebonite Bowling products overseas. And unbeknownst to most residents of the Christian County area, probably one of the keys to future jobs here. Well, as uh, we enter uh, more and more of a world economy, uh, we have to be competitive. Uh, uh, w with products overseas and, and we have to lure uh, those international markets to, to American products. Right now, uh, international sales accounts for about 20% of our total sales. Those sales haven't gone unnoticed by two of Christian County's leading citizens. Judge Executive Frank Gary and Hopkinsville Mayor Wally Bryan thought these visitors important enough to give them a personal welcome. But I always talk about two or three industries in our community. And one of them that I always talk about is Ebonite because we can brag that we're the world's largest producer of bowling balls. So it is indeed a, a real high honor for us to be able to stand here and welcome you all today to our community. But public relations aside, what are Ebonite's chances of scoring a strike in the newly emerging markets of Asia and Eastern Europe? Good, according to these folks, but don't expect a 300 game overnight. Well, uh, the potential definitely would be uh, the same as in Western Germany, but of course it takes time. It definitely takes a few years. I think the bowling business in uh, China will be soon or later will be uh, coming up very high and very fast. In Hopkinsville, James Legilia, TV43 News. Years ago, Radcliffe, Kentucky became the center of national attention and sympathy. America's worst drunk driving accident resulted in the death of 27 children from that community. This morning, school bus drivers from Christian County gathered at North Drive Middle School to hopefully learn from that horrible experience. James Legilia was there. Need to fill this out at the air brake test. To these people, the tragedy that occurred at Carroll County over five years ago will indelibly be on their minds forever. Their local school bus drivers who are giving up part of their Saturday morning to learn about an accident that took 27 young lives within minutes. You can see the flames shooting up over this little embankment right here. And as we pulled up, we stopped a pretty good distance away and we came running up and as we came running up, you can see the kids jumping out of the rear end of the bus while it was on fire. The bus driver in the Carrollton incident was not found at fault. In fact, after a drunk driver hit the school bus, the children's deaths were blamed on, the bus's lack of emergency exits, no protective covering around the gas tank, and the use of gasoline instead of less explosive diesel fuel. 
Nevertheless, state officials want to ensure no Kentucky bus driver causes any accidents in the future. We hope by showing this to everyone, uh, one, show the, the evils of drunk driving, and two, showing uh, that this can happen and, and maybe someone could take ways, get their minds thinking of ways to try to prevent this from happening again in the future. And was the session informative? Very informative. We learned a whole lot about the uh, Carrollton crash, what caused it, what might have caused it. A lot of things that we can do as bus drivers to make our children safer. And what are those things? Just to really watch other people, what they're doing, and pay a lot of attention to what I'm doing. At North Drive Middle School in Hopkinsville, James LaGilia, TV 43 News. Well, it's been nearly a year since Hurricane Andrew laid waste to much of South Florida. In September of last year, residents there saw only despair until some members of the Fort Campbell community put some hope and comfort into their lives. Today, they were honored with humanitarian awards. TV 43's James LaGilia was there. After Hurricane Andrew unleashed its devastating wrath upon the residents of South Florida, these members of the 101st lent a hand. Basically what we did was we helped out people as far as uh, distributing food and clothing and stuff like that. It was basically a humanitarian effort, a good one at that. They're part of the 101st support group, and they provided transportation, medical, and logistic support to the victims of this nation's most devastating hurricane. With the Cold War's end, the military's mission is evolving. It's still a warrior force, but it's now expected to help out in America's other problems. I just see that our rules expanded. We're a smaller army, but we're needed no matter where, whether it's be in our country or overseas. So uh, I think it's a very uh, uh, unique role that we play for the country, and I think the country sees that they need a military, not only just to fight wars, but also to help internally with uh, our fellow countrymen in a time of need. Uh, we've done it uh, year in and year out throughout our history. It's just maybe not as noteworthy uh, in our past as it has been in the present. And I see this role uh, expanding in the future. In Fort Campbell, James LaGilia, TV 43 News. TV 43 News continues. There's a new Mrs. Western Kentucky State Fair. It's Justine Northfleet of Madisonville. Sixteen contestants competed for the title. The ladies were judged in sportswear and evening gown categories. We take you now to the Western Kentucky State Fair where James LaGilia joins us from the convention center. Julie, I'm with Justine Northfleet of Madisonville, 1993's Mrs. Western Kentucky. And I guess you could say this is one of the perks of being a reporter for TV 43 News. Uh, Mrs. Norfleet, uh, congratulations. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, now that this uh, prestigious award has been bestowed upon you, what are your plans for the future? Well, I'm very excited about the week that's coming up. Uh, I get to come over here to Hopkinsville, which is my hometown, and uh, participate in the fair. And I'm sure I'll get to see a lot of people that I hadn't seen in a long time, and I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, tell me, you're involved in uh, sports, that's your business? Yes, I am. Uh, I am co-owner in a business in Madisonville. It's called Penny Ryle Gymnastics and Fitness Center. Uh, we opened it about a year and four months ago. Uh, there, I coach gymnastics to children. I do adult fitness classes. Uh, also, kind of uh, do the bookkeeping and cleaning, just you name it, and I do it. Uh -huh. Did that uh, help you to prepare for this uh, you're in physical fitness-wise? Well, uh, I think when you uh, do exercise and are physically fit that it does help your self-esteem and uh, what have you. But uh, I've been in the pageant before and I, definitely that has helped to uh, get up on stage in front of people and, and talk. Cause, you know, I do that a lot, get up in front of people and talk, and that helps. So yes, I guess it has prepared me in some aspects. Okay, uh, congratulations again and good luck to you. Well, thank you so much. Julie, uh, from the Convention Center at the Western Kentucky Fairgrounds, this is James LaGilia reporting live. Thanks, James. The week-long celebration at the fairgrounds comes to an end tonight. All the rides and concession stands will soon come down and cleanup in the area will begin tomorrow morning. TV43's James LaGilia is standing by live from the fairgrounds.
James? Julie, things are starting to wind down here at the fairgrounds. And to my right is John Michael Morse, president of the fair and one of the gentlemen responsible for this week's activities. John, in, good evening. Uh, good evening, John. In terms of uh, success on a scale of one to ten, how would you rate this year's fair? Well, I would have probably have to rate that on probably on a scale from one, uh, maybe about an eight, uh, because of probably Thursday night. Uh, we had rain on Thursday night, but our attendance was low. Uh, but all in all, it's been a great success. Okay. Well, you, you have any ideas for next year's fair? Next year's fair is going to be even bigger than this. Uh, uh, we had a special called board meeting this morning in which the, the news release will be released uh, probably about the middle of next week on uh, what we're planning on doing for next year's fair, but it promises to be a lot bigger than this year. Okay, well, congratulations on a job well done, and thank you. Thank you. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. In less than two hours, 1993's Western Kentucky State Fair will be history. Now, if you still want to come down, at 11.15, there'll be a $2,500 cast drawing. And also, later on, after that, there'll be a uh, fireworks display. And John says he promises it will be a big one, right, John? That's correct. It'll be a very big one. Okay. And uh, also, tomorrow on First News at 5, let me remind you that we'll have highlights of the Little Jimmy Dickens concert. Live from the Western Kentucky Fairgrounds, I'm James LaGilia. Julie? Thanks, James. Kentucky's NAACP is asking two area high schools to rebel against rebels, or the nickname they use as their logo. The schools will also be asked to eliminate other Confederate symbols they may be using as mascots. Todd Central in Elkton and West Hopkins in Madisonville both identify themselves as the rebels. TV43's James LaGilia reports on whether or not the rebels at Todd County High are up in arms about a possible name change. Welcome to the home of the rebels. At least that's the nickname students here at Todd County Central High School have had since the early 60s. But some local activists agree with Kentucky's National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and say Todd Central, along with seven other Kentucky high schools, needs to change with the times. The rebel and the, and the uh, Confederacy emblem was that group that uh, divided the Union. And so, and, and they were for uh, uh, keeping up slavery, and so I think that uh, uh, what we have to do is uh, just get past that reminder. And uh, uh, I think we need to come back together. As a high school principal, I see the possibility for problems. Bringing people together is also on the mind of Todd Central Principal Art Douglas. He doesn't have any strong feelings one way or the other about the Confederate connotation to rebel or symbols used by the school, but he strongly feels making too much of this issue is likely to divide people. I see a possibility of a polarization of the extremists on both sides with the bulk of the populace not really caring one way or the other about it. Douglas also denies Todd Central's mascot is the Confederate flag or soldier. As far as a mascot, we do not have an official mascot. Whatever configurations that are drawn on our gym floor, that are drawn on our walls, these are just things that students have done. Whether they're official or not, the emblems are clearly visible throughout the school, and many students, black and white, not only feel the time has come to eliminate any references to them, but also believe the nickname and Confederate symbols have hurt their school. I think that the nickname Rebels is okay, but I think that the Confederate flag is a fan, offends a lot of people, and that's what, the reason why a lot of people don't play sports here. It was supposed to be got rid of what it was out for school break, but it wasn't because we took up a petition last year to get rid of it. Douglas says he doesn't remember seeing any petition, and if the NAACP brings forth a petition of its own, the ultimate decision will have to be made by the Todd County Board of Education. At Todd County Central High School, James LaGilia, TV 43 News. Dozens of local business and colleges along with the military and hundreds of individuals have found a unique way to raise money for muscular dystrophy. As TV 43's James LaGilia explains, as opposed to walkathons which take weight off, this activity could put some weight on you. We've all heard of walkathons, bikeathons, telethons, and other thons to raise money for muscular dystrophy. But a pizza thon? The first annual Tuckasee Regional Pizza Pig Out is coordinated by Jeff Colt, a Hopkinsville restaurant owner and national director of fundraising for USA Pizza Network. Basically, a pizza pig out is a pizza eating contest instead of a walkathon. We got tired of walking 20 miles a few years ago and we decided to come up with something a little bit more creative. Money collected from corporations, colleges, Fort Campbell, and other sponsors is expected to benefit Matthew Hallett, 
a muscular dystrophy patient in Clarksville. Kyle enjoys participating. He's been active in muscular dystrophy fundraising throughout his life. And although a pizza-thon may sound a little far-fetched to some, he takes it all very seriously. We have a variety of sizes also you may want to consider. This is a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle special. This is the individual pizza. They have 10 minutes to consume as much as possible. And uh, in the teenage division, or the college division, we have a little bit larger product. They have 10 minutes to consume again. And the consuming will go on all week. College, corporate sponsors, or individuals can sign up and pay a $5 fee for each of their participants. In turn, they make another contribution for every slice participants eat. For a while, it looked as if the cat and bugs wanted to get in the fundraising act. But these participants, sponsored by Hopkinsville Recreation Department, didn't leave any crumbs on their plates. Yeah! Yeah! It's delicious! It's gone! The food is just so great! The culmination of all this is a 24-hour Jerry Lewis pizza eating fundraiser for muscular dystrophy on Labor Day. You can call in your pledges at 1-800-206-CAFE or locally at 885-2719. James Logilia, TV43 News. You're watching TV43, Hopkinsville. And now, from Western Kentucky's news station, this is TV43's 6 o'clock report. Area farmers had a chance to learn about the latest in agricultural technology and marketing techniques today at the 9th Annual Western Kentucky Farm Expo. Good evening, everyone. The Happy Hollow Farm in Hanson, Kentucky hosted the events with 66 sponsors participating. In case you missed it, TV43's James Legilia offers a glimpse. Agriculture has undergone some phenomenal changes in the last few decades, with American technology leading the way. With the world's population expected to double in the next few decades, the next stage of that technological development could be crucial to mankind's future. Our farm expos are very important. At the end of a growing season, farmers trade pointers on problems they had during the year and look forward to increasing production next year. We've got to keep our production ahead of world population growth so there's, there's not famine in the world. The Western Kentucky Farm Expo has gone from being a small get-together of county farmers to the largest agricultural fair in the Penny Ryle region. So what are some of these latest breakthroughs, and are they helping overall productivity? They have come a long ways in the last five years. The, the new tractors, the new 7000 series, has new style hydraulics on them, which gives you a lot more uh, benefits from the fact that you have a little more hydraulic capacity where you can run bigger planters, uh, larger cedars, and that type of equipment than you could in the past. If you look back to 40 years, you see that fact over there, what they got over there and what they got today, it's really changed. Not only is this Farm Expo designed to teach about producing food more efficiently, but fuel more efficiently. There's soy diesel now, and uh, we're running this truck on 30% soy diesel with 70% petroleum. Uh, there's less smoke and less particular emissions, it's cleaner burning, and it's a renewable resource, and our producers right here grow it. Getting back to what agriculture was originally designed for, the Expo featured experts on biotechnology, a technology which could increase crop yields as exponentially as population growth. In corn production, for example, we've added something between a bushel and two bushels per acre per year to corn production over the last 40 years or so since hybrid corns have come in. Uh, we anticipate some of that continuing. Sponsors here also anticipate the Farm Expo's success continuing. Attendance is increasing annually, with the largest number registered this year. At the Happy Hollow Farm in Hanson, Kentucky, James Legilia, TV43 News. A tip of last night about a marijuana patch in Christian County resulted in the confiscation of thousands of dollars worth of marijuana plants this afternoon. TV43's James Legilia has more. This drug eradication mission began simple enough. The Sheriff's Department, in conjunction with Christian County's Auxiliary Police, pulled alongside of Sparkman Road, off Highway 41. But as Sheriff Skillian, his three deputies, and an Auxiliary Policeman walked a quarter of a mile into the woods, they gave the impression of being more on a military operation, and that Washington's so-called war on drugs is indeed a conflict for law enforcement officials. Hey, is there more directly to the road? Mm -hmm. He's, he told me this morning when he brought me in here that the only way, the best way in and the best way out. 
This way. Yeah. That's why we come in this way. Sheriff Skillian's office received a tip on a marijuana patch last night from an informant who ironically learned what marijuana looks like from a TV 43 newscast. Skillian knew the tip was accurate. Two officers were already on the scene. The problem was finding them. We found that it's becoming more and more difficult for us to get to, uh, to the marijuana. They, they go in where the rabbits won't go, so to speak. They make it very difficult. To, uh, they won't be on a beaten path, usually, and it'll be they're not going to be out in the open. After about 40 minutes of walking through a dense wooded area, Skillian found what he was looking for. About 50 marijuana plants, each 12 to 13 feet tall. Okay, about 50 plants, you're looking at $100,000. And uh, do you think... Street value. Uh -huh. Do you think the people growing this are, are in it for the money or just personal use? Yeah, definitely the money. Officers also discovered some fertilizer that the cultivators used on their plants. And for area tobacco farmers who think they have the biggest cash crop in the region, think again. What do you estimate? There's dozens of patches like this all over the county? Or? Oh, hundreds. Hundreds? Hundreds. Yeah, marijuana is the number one crash, cash crop in the state of Kentucky. Sheriff Skillian says the war on drugs in Christian County cannot be won without the cooperation of the public. If you see any of these drug patches, please call the Sheriff Department's drug hotline at 887-4148. James Logilia, TV 43 News. As Congress considers President Clinton's health reform package, the House and Senate will likely scrutinize proposed programs designed to prevent unwanted teenage pregnancies. In recent years, the increase in recurring teen pregnancies has burdened Medicaid programs, but potential solutions to the problem are controversial. TV43 James Logilia looks at a program here at home that's both non-controversial and effective. I was asked on a TV show uh, that what would I do or would I support Norplant? The Jocelyn Elder's confirmation hearings for Surgeon General reignited the passions of an old debate. How far should American society go in order to abate the problem of teenage pregnancy, particularly when those pregnancies are recurring? Should condoms be distributed to our school children? Are sex education programs adequate? Should Norplant be mandatory for single mothers on welfare? They're all controversial solutions to a national problem, and Bible Belt states like Kentucky are no exception. Kentucky has historically had the highest uh, teen pregnancy rate, especially white teen pregnancy rate, than any state in the union. But here in western Kentucky's Christian County, health officials are decreasing some cases of recurring pregnancies, along with problems associated with them, by reviving an age-old concept of neighbor helping neighbor. Meet Michelle Owen and Pat Hewing. For the past couple of years, they've been known in this community as resource mothers. With the consent of parents, Michelle and Pat visit pregnant teens throughout the area, provide them with support through a difficult time, give instruction on proper nutrition for mother and fetus, and advise the expectant teenage mothers on how to prevent future unwanted pregnancies. And the program doesn't stop after the teen has her child. The resource mothers continue to make periodic visits for one year, counseling teens about continuing their education or job training programs, and ensuring both mother and child are healthy. I know that you're not a doctor or anything, but I'll ask you, his le left leg right here, this bone curves real bad. And um, I didn't know, I was thinking about taking him to the health department, should I? And the reason that we initially looked at this program and wanted this program is because we had some data on Christian County's repeat pregnancy rate. Bob Fritz is Christian County's public health director. With the aid of state officials, he brought the Resource Mothers program here to alleviate a high recurring teen pregnancy rate. Four years ago, 46.8% uh, of the teens that were pregnant by age 15 were pregnant the second time by age 19. How are you feeling today? Fine. Since the program's inception in August of 1991, 247 teens have gone through it. Only 10 of those teens had recurring pregnancies before they reached 19 years of age. That 4% figure is well below the county and state averages. State and local officials attribute their success to teens having a not much older trained professional with whom they can communicate with on a personal level. They're real nice. They take you places. And if you need them, you know, only thing you do is just call her. Whoever your resource mother is, you just call her and she'll come there. And hopefully that communication will lead to a better life for both mother and child.
In Hopkinsville, James Legilia, TV 43 News. And now, TV 43 News continues. Trigg County's second industrial site will have a new occupant as of January. As TV 43's James Legilio reports, that new occupant will have a familiar face leading it. Trigg County's second industrial site already has two occupants. But in January of next year, Chelsea Industries and Etheridge Plastics will have a new neighbor. American National Rubber, a West Virginia auto parts supplier, is building a new 15-acre plant here. And Trick County leaders say it was a long time coming. Uh, we, we worked with this company for about five years, and uh, uh, so uh, it was a time well spent uh, with a very, very strong company. American National Rubber may be an out-of-state company, but the person who will lead it is a Trick County native son who had humble beginnings here. I started when I was in college at Murray in 1968 as a production worker, and they, they used me during the summers as a welder and assembler and, and so forth. We grew up in the same community, attended the same schools, and uh, uh, he's just a lot sharper than the county judge of Tree County. He's a brilliant young man, and uh, I followed him uh, all of his life. The plant's construction isn't expected to be completed until December, but it looks like it's already on the road to success. There's a contract with Ford Canada. In addition, several domestic and foreign auto manufacturers have relocated south, with the best examples recently being BMW in South Carolina and Mercedes-Benz in Tuscaloosa. Alabama. Given the geographic location of these markets, Holland feels American rubber is now well situated to supply them. With a new interstate here and new roads, and with a very, very good industrial authority, and with the incentives that the state can provide, it just makes uh, a very, very good place to build plants. Holland adds American rubber will begin accepting applications in a week. Employees should number 45 by next summer and eventually reach 100. In Cadiz, James Legilia. TV 43 News. With countywide elections a little over three weeks away, those candidates facing challenges are already campaigning. TV 43's James Legilia takes a look at two candidates for a Hopkinsville City Council race. The Democratic Party's breakfast Saturday morning and a Republican picnic Sunday afternoon indicate party nominees facing contested elections have revved up their engines and Christian County's 1993 campaign race is underway. We got about eight volunteers that are gonna go out and put out signs today. Uh, we have probably in right around 250 signs to put up, so it could take us probably most of the morning. Like in any campaign, signs and political literature are important, and Thomas's opponent plans to use them, but not as much. One of the biggest complaints in the primary was the amount of signs being put up and how long they've been up. So. One of the things I'm going to do is I'm not going to put my signs out right away. I'm going to wait till probably two weeks before the election. The Fifth Ward is unique among this year's city council races. It's the only council race, in fact, where two candidates from different parties oppose each other. And both nominees appear to have different opinions about what issues are critical to Hopkinsville. Crime is always going to be a big issue in Hopkinsville, and, and I feel like we really could use a stronger police force. I really support the extra police that we are trying to hire now. I know we're trying to get six new uh, uh, police officers. Number one, I'm still concerned about the downtown development area, and I would like to see something done about that. Another issue that I'm still very concerned about, which I talked about in the primary, is the garbage situation and what can be done about that. Voters can make their choice November 2nd, and the council election is citywide meaning you don't have to live in the Fifth Ward to vote for the candidate or party of your choice. At Hopkinsville's North Drive, James Logilia, TV 43 News. You're watching TV 43 Hopkinsville. And now, from Western Kentucky's news station, this is Eric Weiss, Mark Bryant, and Brian Young. And this is TV 43's First News at Five. There's a strong possibility that a new transcontinental highway will be coming through or near Hopkinsville. Good evening, everyone. Plans for I-66 have been in the works since 1991. Congressman Tom Barlow is at Christian County's courthouse and is expected to announce details. We now go live to TV 43's James Legilia. Eric, as you said, plans for I-66 have been in the works since 1991. In that year, Congress passed the Transportation Efficiency Act, paving the way for a transcontinental highway from Washington, D.C. to California. 
Now, Congressman Tom Barlow has introduced an amendment to a bill for such a highway, or I-66, mandating that it have a corridor running through s such cities as Bowling Green, Hopkinsville, and Paducah. We now go live to Congressman Tom Barlow, who will give details on his amendment. Congressman? Well, I'm proud to be working for the families and counties and cities of Western Kentucky. Thank you. After Con Congressman Tom Barlow's full remarks, we'll have a full report at 6 p.m. Eric? TV 43's James Legilia. In several years, Hopkinsville could run alongside a transcontinental highway. Congressman Tom Barlow was at Christian County's courthouse this afternoon announcing details. TV 43's James Legilia has just returned from that news conference and joins us now with more. James? Eric, as you know, plans for I-66 have been in the works since 1991. In that year, Congress passed the Transportation Efficiency Act, paving the way for a transcontinental highway from Washington, D.C. to California. Now, Congressman Barlow has introduced an amendment to a bill for such a highway, or I-66, mandating it have a southern corridor running alongside, among other cities, Bowling Green, Hopkinsville, and Paducah. In his remarks at Christian County's courthouse this afternoon, Congressman Barlow said I-66 will be an economic boon for our area. This is going to give us major, major interstate efficiency for industry needing transportation routings for growth. That will mean jobs here in western Kentucky as plants locate here. And it will help us diversify our economy so that people can stay in farming and have jobs in industry as well. Now, folks, beware. Congressman Barlow's office says that even if his amendment goes through and the money is appropriated, a feasibil feasibility study will have to be done to study the exact route and any potential environmental problems. Then, the House Appropriations and Public Works Committees will have to authorize about $500 million to begin design construction. All in all, we're looking at about 10 years until this whole thing is completed. Eric? Okay, hey, thanks a lot, James. As the recession continues, the American dream of owning a home is becoming more difficult to reach. But TV43's James LaGilia introduces us to one organization that is making that dream a reality for a Hopkinsville family. With today's unseasonably warm weather, Christmas was probably the furthest thing from anybody's mind. But not for Hopkinsville's Adams family. By December 25th, they should have the best holiday present of their lives. We always have wanted to own our own home, but the financial means we wasn't able to. But through Habitat for Humanity, it just helped our dream come true in that way. Habitat for Humanity is a national organization. Since 1976, they've built over 20,000 homes for needy families nationwide and recently, too, in Hopkinsville. The lot, material, equipment, and labor are donated or paid for by the organization, local church groups, and area businesses. The project coordinators emphasize this isn't a handout. They put in uh, 500 hours of what we call sweat equity, and then they pay a $500 down, and uh, this gives them their home, and it's set up on a 20-year loan. They're paying for it monthly, but they're not paying interest. In addition to putting up walls for shelter, the Habitat for Humanity feels they're tearing down walls of societal division. It's really a, a great thing to do because it breaks down all kinds of barriers between people who have more than others, between religions, between races. It's a wonderful way for a community to work together to make a difference. Rosemarie Adams knows this whole experience has made a difference for her sons, Frank Jr. and David. They're just, they just seem to enjoy being out to have a piece of ground of their own to enjoy, to uh, plant, to do around just like I would. And more importantly, watching community members from all walks of life give something back to others less fortunate is bound to positively influence future generations. Off Cullinette Road in Hopkinsville, James Legilia, TV 43 News. A local psychiatrist testified in the trial of attorney Tim Futrell today. Futrell is charged with seven counts of theft by failure to make required disposition of property over $100 and nine counts of second-degree criminal possession of a forged instrument. TV43's James LaGilia has the latest developments on today's highlights in the Futrell trial. 
Today's trial began with the prosecution resting its case, and the defense introduced its first witness, psychiatrist John Joseph Griffin. Griffin testified he first saw Futrell on May 24, 1989, but it wasn't until about a year later that Futrell opened up about the legal malpractice suits against him, and during that time period, Griffin reached a final diagnosis. My initial impression of an adjustment disorder, uh, uh, in hindsight, uh, really wasn't wasn't accurate. It didn't capture the severity of it. So I would say that he had a, a major depressive disorder. From a tactical standpoint, it was unclear where Broderick was trying to go with this testimony. But when the prosecution cross-examined Dr. Griffin, it was clear Richwalski was trying to dispel any doubts the jurors may have been harboring about whether or not Futrell was cognizant of his actions. Richwalski focused on the fact that Griffin did not advise Futrell absolutely stop working because he saw him as no significant threat to his clients. But it was one statement by Dr. Griffin that possibly negated any favorable testimony he may have given for the defense. Can you tell the jury at any time whether the defendant, in your opinion, did not know right from wrong? As best I could tell, uh, the whole time that I saw him, he knew right from wrong. During the afternoon, Futrell's former wife and legal assistant testified, and she was examined and cross-examined on both their professional and personal relationship. Broderick then called another witness to the stand, and it's not yet clear how many more witnesses he'll call before closing arguments commence. At the courthouse, James Legilia, TV 43 News. Well, Santa Claus made an early appearance in our area by making a special trip to Oak Grove to deliver some presents to children. TV 43's James Legilia covered his arrival. Even Santa Claus participated in Oak Grove's first annual Toys for Tots, sponsored by the town's police department and residents. His mission was to help collect hundreds of presents for Oak Grove's needy children this Sunday afternoon. But Santa appeared to be utilizing an unconventional mode of delivery this year. Why motorcycles? Uh, oh, the reindeer are taking a break to see, well, for a couple of days, getting ready for the, the big season, Christmas Day. Well, using motorcycles as a substitute for reindeer may be one motive, but riders here also want to spruce up their image. Everybody's got uh, bad feelings about people who ride motorcycles, and this is one of the ways that we try to show the public that uh, we're not all bad. The event is dedicated to Oak Grove police officer Danny Pollard, who was slain in January of this year. Each motorcycle rider participating in the parade around Oak Grove donated a new toy to be given to a child for Christmas. Pollard's family led the parade and were escorted in a police car. It wasn't quite what organizers had hoped for, but as the old adage goes, wait till next year. It's not what as many people involved in as we thought, but it's wonderful for the first. You, everybody, you gotta start somewhere. And the culmination of the Toys for Tots parade was a rally outside of Fort Campbell's Gate 5. There, bikers deposited their donations as the late Danny Pollard's children looked on. The toys will all be distributed in December. In Oak Grove, James Legilia, TV 43 News. Watching TV 43, Hopkinsville. And now, from Western Kentucky's news station, this is TV 43 News Watch at 10. Good evening and welcome to TV 43 News. I'm Michelle Young. After a six-week trial and two days of deliberations, 12 jurors reach verdicts in the trial of attorney Tim Futrell. TV 43's James Legilli has just returned from the courthouse and is standing by live in our newsroom with details. James? Michelle, as you know, Mr. Futrell was charged with a total of 16 counts. Seven of those counts were for theft by failure to make required disposition of property over $100. Nine other counts were for second-degree criminal possession of a forged instrument. Altogether, Mr. Future was found guilty on eight counts, not guilty on the other eight. Now, regarding the seven counts of theft, Mr. Future was found guilty on five, not guilty on two. Regarding the nine counts of forgery, guilty on three, not guilty on six. Outside the Christian County Courthouse, two of the alleged victims, Donnie Lee and Ada Diane Brown, commented on the verdicts. 
I just feel it's a verdict for the little man, and I couldn't be happier, and maybe it'll tell some of these other lawyers that straighten up or get out. Honesty is the best policy. That's basically it. That's it. And there is justice for the little people. Tomorrow, the defense and prosecution will have an opportunity to give opening statement to jurors regarding sentencing. Jurors will then again deliberate to ascertain sentencing recommendations for each guilty count. There must be a unanimous sentencing recommendation for e both each count and whether the sentences will be served consecutively or concurrently. TV 43 will have a full report on these developments tomorrow on First News at 5. Michelle? Thanks, James. Mu You're watching TV 43, Hopkinsville. And now, from Western Kentucky's news station, this is TV 43's News Late Night. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to TV 43 News. I'm Michelle Young. Christian County school systems are on their way to developing a five-year affirmative action plan. A cross-section of county residents attended a meeting at the Board of Education this evening to determine how and when that plan might be completed. TV 43's James Legilli has just returned from that meeting and is live in our newsroom with a full report. James? Michelle, as you know, several weeks ago, the state responded to concerns by some local residents regarding minority hiring in the Christian County school system. Commonwealth officials made an inquiry and concluded there was not a proportionate number of minority teachers relative to minority students. The state made about a dozen recommendations, one of which was developing a five-year affirmative action plan. Now, TV43 had released its own study and found the system is actually in the top one-third in terms of percentage of minority faculty versus the percentage of minority students. Based on that report, I asked Dr. Kirby Hall tonight if he felt Christian County school system was being unfairly singled out. I really don't even uh, approach the issue from that perspective. I simply look at it and say that uh, the kinds of things that the report would be asking us to deal with are kinds of things that are good for our school district. Dr. Hall told those present the state must have a plan on January 30th, 1994. He therefore wants to wrap up the plan by January 13th for approval by the Board of Education on January 20th. It's also going to cost an already financially strapped school system money. A personnel director will be hired and his or her salary will be between fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year. In addition, other funds will have to be allocated for that director's clerical staff and recruiting budget. The next meeting for the Affirmative Action Committee is November 29th, and Dr. Hall encourages the Christian County community to get involved. Michelle? And we'll be sure to follow those developments. Thanks, James. You're watching TV 43, Hopkinsville. And now, from Western Kentucky's news station, this is TV 43 News Watch at 10. Good evening and welcome to TV 43 News. I'm Michelle Young. The Hopkinsville City Council Community Development Committee unanimously passed a motion regarding nonpartisan elections in Hopkinsville. That motion and two other major issues were discussed at this evening's City Council meeting. TV 43's James Legilia is live in our newsroom with more details. James? Michelle, during the last City Council meeting on November 2nd, or Election Day, Councilman Bob Pickerell suggested the Communi Community Development Committee study the implementation of nonpartisan elections in Hopkinsville. This evening, that committee unanimously passed a motion to present such an ordinance to City Council. The City Council is expected to vote on the motion during its next meeting on December 7th. Republican Councilman-elect Walker Thomas attended this evening's committee meeting and echoed a rationale for members wanting to implement such a system. A lot of times some of the candidates might not, or individuals might not run because of their party denomination. That way people, instead of voting their straight party tickets, will have, have to look at the ballot closer and actually know the candidates instead of actually maybe not knowing one or the other candidates. Now what a nonpartisan election would allow the voter to do would be to vote for a candidate during a primary regardless of that candidate's party or the voter's party registration. Candidates for city offices would be listed on a slate together, but their party affiliation would be omitted. If passed, the ordinance would put Hopkinsville in with the majority of municipalities in Kentucky, and the ordinance would take effect for 1996 elections. Michelle? 
Thanks, James. You're watching TV 43, Hopkinsville. And now, from Western Kentucky's news station, this is TV 43 News Watch at 10. Good evening. I'm glad you could join us. I'm Michelle Bodeway. Well, an accidental shooting ended tragically for a Todd County youngster this afternoon. TV 43's James LaGilia has returned from the scene and has a full report. James? Michelle, on an, in an ironic tragedy on the day after the Brady Bill was filibustered in the United States Senate, a 13-year-old Guthrie boy is now dead, uh, the victim of a, an apparent shooting in a neighbor's apartment. TV 43 has the name of the juvenile, but at the request of Kentucky State Police, we will not release it at this time. According to Kentucky State Police Detective J.W. Sal, the incident occurred at Guthrie's Penny Rowell Village in apartment P39. Four boys, two residents of the apartment, were going through drawers when a gun was found. After a minor skirmish ensued about who would put it back, the weapon discharged. Witnesses ran to a neighbor's apartment, and that neighbor reportedly notified her 17-year-old nephew, Ricky Williams. She told him then we came out here, the door was locked and stuff. And then she said a little boy was in there shot and he couldn't get up, so I was in I bust down the door, went in there and then I ran over there and called 911. But Detective Saul isn't confirming that story. I mean he told me that he saw the body, I mean and he called nine one one is but yeah. can you confirm that or you don't know? Or? He may have, but this other lady told me she had was the one that called nine one one. I don't know till I get through with the investigation. Detective Saul does confirm that an autopsy will be performed and the investigation will continue for several days. No charges have been filed at this time. Michelle? Thanks, James. Sad story.